Where is home? And how do we find it? That search can take people on tremendous global journeys. The history of migration is not one people, one country, one culture, or one story. We're all travelers in this life. And we shape in our soul by experiences. There's a mystical side to migration. to make this journey very positive. I've been helping people to believe in themselves again. We're all travelers in this life. I came to Australia with mum and dad on the 30th of April, 1976. There's a mystical side to migration. Uh, there's a realistic side of it, of course, but um, we have to really um, create a balance when we migrate and we go through a journey. New arrivals sometimes come from very traumatized, um, with tra very traumatized experiences. And um, so these, these souls, these people, um, need a lot of help. And they're here, they arrive here and they're in the right hands. They, they, they're going to get the help. I know there's crisis at the moment, but I really, my message there is that have faith and keep seeking help and focus on the positive and use all the tools and, and um, try to learn as much as this culture. By embracing the unknown and confronting what comes to us, we are presented sometimes with opportunities that we never imagined we would have been presented. I was born in Montevideo, South America, and migrated when I was 18 years old. Dad and mom sort of shaped us and prepared us to confront migration, I think to be prepared to go to another country. That was in their subconscious because they never planned before when they were young. But it took us two years for the process of organize and, and research. But he knew there was somewhere else that was important to go to. Yes, yes. He was a clever Why? man. Why did he say that? Because he, um, I think that Uruguay was getting too small for him, you know. <laughs> it's such a tiny country, remember, it's the heart. It's at the bottom of South America. It's the heart of South America, el corazón de Sudamérica. So that's um, so that probably uh, thought he needed a challenge, and we talked after forty years, thirty-eight years of migration before he passed away, that he he loves Australia. So he he kept coming and going all the time, and he really. Um, transmitted that sense of belonging to the kids, mom as well. Um, so I, I believe mom and dad helped us um, to cope with migration more than we think. But when you say belonging, you mean belonging yeah. to the new country or belonging to more than one country? Belonging to more than one country. We, uh, they believed and I believe now that we just are uh, travelers in this life, you know, and and we shape in our soul by experiences. And then um, it's really lovely how we grew up with that, saying that, and it's, it's in us, you know. We, we, we're not afraid uh, to go somewhere different, like to the unknown. There's always things to explore. There's nothing is impossible. And that said, whatever you want to achieve, you will achieve. Nothing is a failure. You're just going through the experience 
And um, so the, all that, having great parents like we had, helped us to cope with migration. Do you think being born into Uruguayan culture with your father allowed for that connection and that passion between father and daughter, not so much a division of gender? That's great, the way you put it. That's a great question. That's how I felt always. The three daughters, we have a great connection with that because he made us feel that not because we have a, the body of a woman that we cannot do things. It's just go forward, go forward. Um, and that connection helped me to go further and explore all the time because of that uh, passion for, for life. Uruguayans, we are a bit of a mixture. Uruguayans, we are a bit of a mixture of European culture and a bit of um, Uruguayan from the land. We don't have Indians anymore. They were extermined. Um, not like uh, Peruvians, that they're very lucky they still have the their, um, indigenous people or the Chileans or the Argentinians. But we, we don't have, we, we mainly basically um, European um, ancestry. That had all those qualities of a European plus uh, acquired from Uruguayan land, you know, the gaucho from the country because dad was born in a cattle farm. My grandfather had a big cattle farm, so he's got the mixture of the um, country and the city. When he was a kid, he decided to go to the city and study. Uruguay is a, is a country and culture formed out of migration. Yes, yes, it is. It is formed out of migration and out of um, um, Spanish from the uh, time of the colony, because we, we were a colony as well. Um, but also uh, we have the, the countrymen and also the Africans, you know, when they were brought as slaves. This is a very long history in uh, Uruguay. And um, so we have a bit of um, a mixture of, like you say, multiculturalism, different races. Um, we, have, uh, we had Welsh communities. We had um, Jewish communities. Um, so we were, we were growing up around. Uh, so coming, coming to Melbourne, it was like coming to the biggest sister city, except for the language, like I said, you know, the difference was the language. The population that we met when we just came here, it wasn't a shock for us. It was really, we felt at home. Montevideo and Melbourne, they're in the same latitude, 35. That's another coincidence, you know. <laughs> the climate is the same, the same type of food. We grew up more or less in a multicultural society. I came to Australia with mom and dad and my three siblings. We didn't have economical reasons. We were not refugees. We came as legal migrants. My younger sister didn't want to. She was only 10 to 12, probably she was. But dad said, no, no one can stay. We have to go as a family. And then if you don't like it, we come back in within one year. So okay. it was like more like a touristic <clears throat> um, experience at the beginning. Right, yes. And um, we could afford it because that saved and, you know. So it was really um, a great experience to arrive in Australia. Life is a journey that we have to really enjoy who comes across us all the time because we never know if we're going to be dead tomorrow. <laughs> We live of the grace of the universe. <laughs> the circumstances of Uruguay at the time, was it difficult? In the 1970s, it was all under dictatorship. And probably that didn't tell us that, but he was also worried something could happen to my daughters and my son mm -hmm. if I don't take them out of the country. That's what that as well thought. I mean, we, we were not suffering financially, but we were, there wasn't much freedom at that time. So dad was worried about me especially and my, do my other sister because I wanted to be a lawyer and probably by, by now I wouldn't have existed on this earth, you know, because I wanted to be a person to defend the poor and the human rights and all that. 
and uh, I wanted to be a judge to defend the freedom fighters. And at that time, there was a lot of commotion with the rights and the left. Lots of things happening, and um, we had the coup d'etat as well. Um, and then that said, well, probably this is the time to migrate. That was always consulting. We take it as an adventure. If you don't like it, if you suffer, if you don't ad adapt or assimilate, we can come back within one year or two. And that was a condition with the consulate, you know, that mm -hmm. we had only two years mm -hmm. uh, to stay. And then if we decided we could come back, we could go back to Uruguay, South America. And we never went back. When we arrived in Australia at Sydney Airport, we didn't know where we we're going to stay. They said we we're going to have apartments. When we arrived, everybody was so friendly. I was the only one in the family that spoke a bit of English because at high school you, you learn basic English, really, like here, learning languages. Um, so um, we could communicate. They communicated with us. They were not interpreters like now that you have hundreds of interpreters everywhere. So we had to rely on ourselves and the nice people from customs. Everybody was so friendly. We, we never felt isolated. Uh, we never felt um, left alone. You know, they, they really took, a, uh, took us in groups and drove us to the hostel, you know, the one that is a detention center now, you know, the oh. uh, Villa Good Hostel. Right. That's where we stayed. Okay. And we had nice apartments there and we started blending in straight away. We had people talking to us the next day, uh, breakfast, uh, all prepared for us and we started studying straight away and blending in with the communities and oh it was fantastic it was really great some of the people from Uruguay Argentina and Chile that we were coming with us or Peru they were all sent to different towns there was only a couple of families that were sent to Sydney we were the lucky ones some were sent to Wollongong and some were sent to Adelaide Melbourne to another plane. So we were really um, settling. They, uh, something happened in customs that they selected us to stay in Sydney. Yes. So the people you were mixing with were from other countries? Yes, they are in, um, in the hostels, at the hostels. There were a, a lot of Asians in those days, people from Timor. Uh, I remember in the 70s, there was so much going on there from Asia and from um, some from Chile, refugees from Chile that they were coming to, to stay after the coup d'etat and Allende's uh, yeah. fall. And um, because of the dictatorship going around in South America, people were trying to uh, flee. We were very blessed, some of the lucky ones, that we didn't have to... Our migrant experience has been um, sort of a more blessing than other people that come with many traumas of torture. We were lucky. We had mom and dad, and we were happy kids, uh, adjusted straight away. Mum and dad had it harder than us because they didn't speak the language, only a few words and um, good morning, good afternoon, hello, thank you. At that point, you had a new role in the family and yes. a new role in your life. Yes, yes. Were you aware of that responsibility? And... Yes, I was aware and mum and dad and the kids let me know and they made me aware of that because especially when I couldn't understand some of the um, Australian people because of the accent. My teachers were English or American, so I was used to a different accent. And um, so it was really funny because sometimes people have to show me what they were asking me to go. So where is the lift? And or I, I would say, where is the elevator? And um, and my brother said, I thought we had you as an interpreter, you know? <laughs> All of the sudden, I had to be responsible for my mom and dad and, and my siblings. Nada debemos esperar, sino de nosotros mismos. Nothing we must expect, except from ourselves. All of the sudden, I had to be responsible for 
my mom and dad and, and my siblings, you know, I, I, I had to understand. Everybody took the English courses. It was really fantastic in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, straight away, intensive courses. And there was so much for us, uh, for migrants in those days. I mean, they still are now, but it's getting harder because of the amount of uh, migrants and, and needs. And uh, But in those days, straight away, we were put onto intensive courses. Um, uh, we had a, um, a coordinator at the hostel to show us every day things that we had to do. And uh, we joined in the courses and to learn the language straight away. We wanted to know more and more. So it was very exciting because don't forget I was 18. I had my identity. I was uh, very well trained by that and my teachers. I was doing law. I, I had my identity, so nothing was going to crack me down. Probably my brother and sisters had it harder because they were still going through a transition of puberty and high school. That's the hardest. It's harder for, the, for, for kids that age. I was the, the adventurous soul like that, enjoying the experience, so it didn't affect me, the migration. Montevideo is a cosmopolitan um, city like Melbourne, and um, so we had a mixture of cultures there. So probably the neighbor next to us was African background. Mm -hmm. Another one was Spanish background and um, Uruguayan born, but they had second generation migrants. We felt connected to the land straight away, maybe because we had ancestors that they were Europeans. And when we arrived in Australia, the, the difference, the striking difference would be the language. Your grandparents and before, where did they come from? They came from Spain and Which my great, part of Spain? Um, uh, the northern of Spain, like Basque background. And um, one of my great grandfathers was um, from Scotland, married my great grandma. So probably there's a bit of a connection in the blood that we, we fell at home here when we arrived in Australia. We cannot um, stereotype someone from a country, oh, she's Uruguayan. I'm, I'm, I'm completely the opposite to just a Uruguayan. I'm, I'm shaped, like I feel like I'm the citizen, a citizen of the world, like I said before, shaped from different cultures, not only my own origin. So because I've been traveling, I migrated young. I've been exposed to different cultures. We're very lucky in Australia, it's like, I felt I was coming to the Noah's Ark, you know, the people from all over, like like animals from all the different <laughs> Because kingdoms. this will be the new culture. This will yeah. be the global culture. Yes, it's the global. It's beautiful. I mean, I feel like a character in a movie, you know. I feel part of their, part of their movie as well. I feel part of their life as well. So I relate to people because don't forget that I emphasize on, on, on relationships a lot. So I, my quest is always getting to know people, learning from people, exchanging culture, exchanging uh, knowledge or exchanging um, friendships. So I really feel that I belong to that culture as well. I'm, 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 I'm like that, but don't forget because I've been working, embracing and working with um, thousands of kids for decades. So. Um, students train us as well to feel that way and embrace and, uh, and accept the different cultures. The key to um, the diversity of cultures, there's a different, different type of religious ideas, different um, beliefs at home, different rules um, um, outside school, for example. But uh, the main thing is to talk about those values, but also assimilate and, um, and accept where you are. Be open. So you arrive to this country, bring in your values, with, which are going to be uh, appreciated. They're going to be loved and they're going to be accepted and respected. But also assimilate where you are. Adaptation, assimilation, uh, uh, are very important ingredients into a successful life as a migrant. Adapt to the culture you come to. That's very important. 
Um, the same story with the Aboriginals when I was going there. They, 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 uh, Aboriginals are um, a beautiful culture. They're part of the land. Well, they remain there. And then they try to assimilate. We have great Aboriginals in politics, politics, sports, and all that. So that's the great role model we have, how they try to assimilate and, and integrate. So migrants from different cultures that they come here, they can bring their richness with them, but also they have to be open-minded and accept and perform according to, to our law here. And that will help their kids, will help our kids to feel more secure and have an identity. That's what is so-called identity. And identity is not only, oh, I come from South America, I come from Spain, I come from Asia. No, identity is the sense of belonging to the land. And it could be a new migrant feeling more settled and grounded here than probably a migrant that has been 40 years, or even a, an Anglo-Saxon who live here all their lives. It's to do with the person. It's to do with the personality, with the soul. Not so much, in my case, with the country you come from. Because already I've been away from the country I was born 39 years. I consider more Australian than Uruguayan. People bring values into this country and use those values, but also learn about our values from, from Australia, which is very important. And with a mixture of those values, we can heal and we can create a better life for us. To me, relationship has been very important. Like you go in the bus and you happen to talk to someone in the, in the, um, in the bus. And you, you end up seeing the same person every Friday morning if you take the same bus. That's forming a relationship. That's really talking to another human being. That's really encouraging people to communicate. That creates a better world by just checking who is next to us. Who is traveling next to us tonight? Or who is going in the train? So uh, building up relationships. And it's, it's really beautiful to see the changes in the last... 30 years when I migrated to now. Everybody's talking to everybody. Sometimes in the bus stop, everybody seems to, to be talking. So it's not the typical um, Anglo-Saxon in the old days that tried to go behind the newspapers. No, it's beautiful how I think that we influence as migrants, you know, the, the Anglo-Saxon culture. And we're very, very lucky to have a country like this to receive us as a, as a mom and dad. Like I felt embraced straight away by Australia. And I feel that by coming to Australia and being a teacher here for um, so many decades, I felt my mission accomplished. If you believe you have an interesting migration story to tell, contact us at this email address. We'd like to represent as many nationalities as possible in this program. Moroccans, Algerians, Tunisians, French and Spanish. You've got people from all around the world in one place. 